I think Walt Brown has the best theory on continental drift. Let me play this for you real quickly. This is the what's called the hydroplate theory by Dr. Brown. To me, it answers a lot of questions. We can see on our planet 17 very strange features that can now be systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose waters erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 10 billion hydrogen bombs. This explanation shows us just how rapidly major mountains formed. It explains the coal and oil deposits, rapid continental drift, why ocean floors have huge trenches and hundreds of canyons and volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layered strata and most of the fossil record, the so-called ice ages and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. The pre-flood Earth probably had one very large supercontinent containing lush vegetation, seas, rivers, and minor mountains. According to the hydroplate theory, the pre-flood Earth had a lot of subterranean water, about half of what is now in our oceans. This water was in interconnected chambers forming a thin spherical shell about half a mile thick, perhaps 10 miles below the Earth's surface. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water chamber stretched the overlying crust just as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack following the path of least resistance encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlying crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 10 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. Calculations show that all along this globe encircling crack, fountains of water jetted supersonically over 20 miles into the atmosphere. The spray from this enormous fountain produced torrential rains such as the Earth has never experienced before or after. The Bible states that all the fountains of the great deep burst open on one day. And it describes these events about four and a half thousand years ago, which we can now tie together scientifically in cause and effect order as the hydroplate theory. The fountains of the great deep and the expanding steam produced violent winds. Some of the water jetting high above the cold stratosphere froze into supercooled ice crystals and produced some massive ice dumps, burying, suffocating, and instantly freezing many animals. The high pressure fountains eroded the rock on both sides of the crack and even threw up the limey contents of many pre-flood seas. Huge volumes of sediments settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. The flooding uprooted vegetation, moving it to regions where it accumulated and quickly became coal and oil by processes we can duplicate in the laboratory today. Experiments show that as erosion widened the rupture, its width became so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like the seam of a baseball. The continental plates, the hydroplates, still with lubricating water beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of about 45 miles an hour, they ran into resistances, compressed, crushed, thickened, and buckled. The portions of the hydroplates that buckled up formed mountains. Those that buckled down formed ocean trenches. This is why these features are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges 
from which they slid. The hydroplates in sliding away from the oceanic ridges opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. Every continental basin was naturally left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. Each lake that grew from rainfall or drainage from higher elevations spilled over its rim at the lowest point of the rim. That eroded a little notch in the rim, allowing even more water to flow through the notch faster, cutting the soft flood deposited sediments even deeper. This process accelerated until all the lake's water dumped through a very deep slit, forming a canyon. The largest of these was the Grand Canyon. North and east of the Grand Canyon was a huge lake that I have identified and named Grand Lake. Its dumping released more water than is in all five of the Great Lakes combined. Grand Lake spilled over its rim, eroded its dam, 20 miles south of Page, Arizona, catastrophically forming the Grand Canyon within a few weeks. There. That is uh, Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, which to me makes the most sense of anything I've seen. It explains several things. If the crack uh, would widen around the mid-Atlantic Ridge as the water is shooting out, it's going to spread out, allowing the basalt underneath to bulge up, which is precisely what happens. As the basalt bulges up, it's going to get cracks in it, and it's also going to slide the superimposing uh, plates away from them. They're going to slide and run into something else, and it, it, it would explain the compressed mountains we see in, uh, for instance, British Columbia, where the mountains are smashed from the end. I mean, the wrinkles go up and down. The mountain was it's like somebody pushed carpet up against the wall, causing it to wrinkle. I think Christians need to have an answer for those kind of things, and this is one of the possible answers. When the basalt cracked, the water would rush into the crack, cooling it down, and cool rock holds a magnetic field. Hot rock will lose a magnetic field. So when they found what they said were magnetic reversals at the bottom of the ocean floor, they're actually finding the old cracks where the basalt broke because there were going to be uh, warmer and cooler areas from simply the water rushing in. Those cracks are probably now all full of sediments. So don't let them tell you there are magnetic reversals. There may be a few from the rocks flipping over at the flood, but I think a much better theory is the hydroplate theory. So, as the continents were sliding away, some places are going to be sucked under, plate subduction. Now, Baumgartner has a great theory on plate subduction. I think his ties in here also, that uh, the plates would tend to be sucked down. You ever stir pudding up and it gets a film on top? If you push in on the film on the pudding, it'll sink to the bottom and drag the rest of it with it. Magma does the same thing from a volcano. When it cools down, the lava gets a hard crust, and then if, you, if it sinks in one place, it'll drag a whole sheet of magma of lava with it. This probably happened also during the flood. See, the continents are eroding. When it rains, you have landslides, mudslides, erosion, mass wasting, ground creep. All of those things are happening continually. Like last night in the thunderstorm here. I'm sure a lot of erosion took place around Chattanooga. Well, this mud is going to wash into the ocean. So two things are happening. The mountains are getting shorter. The oceans are filling in. But at the current rate of erosion, the continents are going to erode flat in 14 million years. So the evolutionists have a serious problem. They have to explain two things. Why aren't the oceans full of mud? Because there's only a few thousand years worth of mud in the oceans. And why haven't the mountains eroded away yet? That's why this Pangea theory is so important to them. Because they can say, oh, it's being recycled. They'll say the ocean floor doesn't have much mud because it, it gets pulled under and remelted and comes up again in the middle. So it's being recycled. Well, that may be. But there's another reason. It may be there's not much mud down there because it's not millions of years old. Plates are moving. There's not much question about that. But that doesn't prove they've always been moving. And it doesn't prove the rate has always been the same as we see today. I think students should be told there are other options than what they're being taught in school. Now, I live right by Interstate 10 in Pensacola, Florida. Interstate 10 runs all the way from Los Angeles to Jacksonville, Florida. If I see somebody headed east on Interstate 10 at 70 miles an hour, does that prove they started in Los Angeles four days ago? Uh, no, they might have just got on at the last exit, right? And just because we see these continents moving a little bit today does not prove anything long-term historically. Don't fall for that propaganda. The continental drift theory <clears throat> is designed to avoid two problems for the evolutionist. One, the magnetic field's getting weaker. 
Number two, there's very little sediment in the ocean. And another explanation for that might be that the Bible is right and the earth is not billions of years old. 